it's a pleasure to be here, um, and uh, I, I hope to be able to share with you a little bit of, of what we're doing. I will not give you a general talk about the Human Brain Project or the Blue Brain Project. Um, you'll, you'll be able, you either have heard them before, or essentially you don't want to hear them, or you'll hear them in another place. What I'm trying to talk about is really essentially something which we learned to to a method which I think is common to these two projects, which we learned to adopt and which we think is, is essentially complementing our approaches to understanding the brain, which in, uh, first and foremost is experimentation and then theory and really using in silico neuroscience and simulations we think adds to this perspective as a tool in our, our toolbox to, to help understand um, the, or challenge, tackle this, this problem. Um, now I have to get something off my chest right from the start. Um, you don't have to be a bird to fly, right? You can very well build something very different that essentially can mimic certain properties of flight. Now what do these pictures have to do in, in a talk about uh, brain and, and the neuroinformatics uh, context? Now the thing is, when we, the brain is an interesting system. It's a physical system. Um, but it also is an information processing system and it does things, it has features and it exhibits function which we often times think of when we want to understand the brain. So essentially we, we talk about learning, we talk about object recognition, we talk about adaptability, we talk about um, um, taking smart decisions, all these sorts of things are properties the brain as a physical system exhibits, but we are learning from look at the game of chess, look at Jeopardy, look at other things that sort of we meanwhile have found engineering solutions, a lot of mathematics, um, uh, statistical correlations, higher order mathematics, all of that, we've learned that we can mimic some of these functions like playing chess in a very different way. So essentially we can, we can mimic the function of flight with something very different. Now, um, Sometimes this might be sharing the same principles. I mean, sort of, uh, why is actually something lifting and, and hovering in the air? But essentially, you might be even finding types of, of, of the same function, which actually is based on different physical principles. So, bottom line is, I mean, you can, and it's very legitimate to do that. And essentially, I think it's just important to discriminate that sort of, if you want to mimic a function of the brain, you don't necessarily need to look at the brain of how to do that. You can, whatever brings you there, um, might uh, might be legitimate. If you, want, on the other hand, want to understand how exactly that bird is flying, you you have to study that bird. And that's really where it brings us back to the brain, that sort of if we want to understand a particular brain of how that brain works, how it actually maybe fails to work, and sort of how actually it all comes about, you have to study that very system in the detail that system uh, presents itself with. Now, um, obviously, a naive way of going about um, modeling um, a system is sort of that you start with a certain type of experiment. You actually have a hypothesis about what is it that system in this experimental condition is presenting itself, and you make some assumptions about how you want to capture this experimental outcome. And you essentially t choose a formalism, you choose a set of mathematical equations, you essentially parameterize it, and then of course you essentially check whether the mathematical equations describing your experimental system come up with, with predictions about that very, very system. And more often than, than, than you actually try to, to validate and close that loop. And more often than, than rarely you essentially have to of course tune your parameters, adjust your mathematical formula and include another set of mechanisms. So essentially this is a typical naive view of how hypothesis-driven um, modeling might, might go about. Now, what we've seen is that essentially we actually end up with a lot of these different um, uh, models and explanations because people pick a certain experiment, say like, how can I model this type of, of observation and come up with a different set of mathematical equations and assumptions. And as a matter of fact, as a physicist, physics has been very successful with this model. I mean, this way we actually managed to, to simplify, to extract um, the, the, the basic features of certain parts of our world and build an entire theory system that essentially um, is a consistent view of most of the physical phenomena we find. So essentially this keep it simple, stupid principle to sort of really try to minimize the description of a system has been uh, very successful in physics. However, of course, it is true that there are some systems, even in physics, where sort of it is not so clear whether um, a simple hypothesis, a simple explanation is, uh, is, is, is achievable. And think of, for example, climate. 
if we really want to understand how in 35 years from today um, the water levels in, in these beautiful uh, um, water streets of Leiden will look like, it will not be easy to come up with an easy back of an envelope calculation of what will be the water levels. It will depend a lot on sort of the currents, the, the slope of, this, of the coastline, the, obviously what all happens in the rest of the world. So essentially for a complex system like, like the climate, we will have to put in a lot of detail. Sort of coming up with individual, um, small, independent explanations for certain features of sort of how water is evaporating if the sun increases, or sort of how um, uh, the water, the ice will be melting. That might not be enough. We will have to put it all together. And so the the point there really is that essentially some physical systems seem to be having so much layered uh, detail on top of each other, that sort of um, we might have to really look at the intricate details of that system. And um, physics actually has found a another way of going about it, and essentially there's a term called ab initio model. So especially for these complex systems where it's not, where you can't expect that you really will have a simple understanding for the, for the phenomenon, you actually start from the first principles, take the fundamental physical elements, put them all together with all the little details, and then see what emergent phenomena come out of essentially the solving of these equations. And examples for that, especially from solid state physics, where sort of if you want to understand whether a certain material is a high temperature superconductor, it's very difficult to say a priori whether a material has this property. So what people do is they actually model every single type of atom and every layer, uh, look how the different um, quantum mechanical wave functions overlap, and then produce, calculate an emergent property and see whether that such a system could be a superconductor. And it's this type of an ab initio type modeling which we started to adopt for, for the brain. Now, when I say ab initio, I really have to say Abinizio like because essentially I, I, we didn't start at the quantum mechanical description of every single atom in our system, but we chose a certain level, but very much with this idea of capturing what is there in the brain without any pre, uh, pre assumed hypothesis of what is the function, but essentially starting to describe the individual pieces. And that's what of what I want to, to share with you. Now, we don't call it a initio like model or a initio model, we call it a unifying model. So the idea is that instead of building for one experiment, one model, that you invest a lot in the infrastructure that essentially extracts out of the data certain parameters and essentially you build a single model and then you validate this model. So you model the individual pieces and I'll go into more detail. So you model the channels, you model the cells, you model the interactions and then you essentially um, expose that model to a lot of differential uh, uh, experimental uh, situations and essentially refine this model in a circle. So instead of building different models, you're trying to improve this one model with all the details um, that you experimentally find. Now, obviously, um, if you look at the scales relevant to the brain, um, it's scary in a way. So anything uh, from the level of nanometers to the level of decimeters, so if you look at this from a physical point of view, that's um, nine orders of magnitude difference of, of scales. And then, of course, biological systems, in addition, exhibit very different timescales from lifespan to essentially uh, um, chemical um, time scales that sort of are maybe on the on the nanosecond scale. So essentially, if you put this all together, relevant scales for the brain are anything in the order of nine orders of magnitude of space and 18 orders of magnitude of, of time. So this is a huge, complex uh, physical system we're looking about. If you look at it from a computational point of view, um, as a computer scientist, it's interesting. So this one is what we would call weak scaling. So this is essentially um, something which you can get at if you, if you have a, a bigger computer, versus this one is something you will have to essentially accelerate time. You have to get to your solution faster. And that has quite some, some interesting applications because essentially this one might be the easy part, but sort of 
bridging timescales of years in a, in, a, in a laboratory time frame so that within a half day you can come back and come back to your um, results is something difficult. And that's exactly what climate, for example, is uh, challenged by climate research. It takes easily two months for them to run a model. So essentially you have like one output, you come back to your results two months later. I mean, it's, it's very hard to iterate that. So this is computationally speaking, as a computer scientist, it's a great challenge because that that's, tells us that for years to come we have a lot of work to do. Now, if you look again at these spatial scales, um, it's not only the spatial scales, but there are different abstraction or different types of physics that you might have to consider. And it really, you might sort of come up with, with sort of um, uh, abstract ways of, of describing um, the, the whole function of the brain. There's an entire neuron-based abstraction where a lot of um, tools also from people present in this in this room sort of have been working on a sort of how to describe the physics of this um, of these spatial scales based on a neuronal abstraction and then you go into what would, would be more chemically um, relevant sort of you can describe this as a reaction diffusion mathematics um, or even you have to go to to do the description of how atoms interact with each other and essentially these are tools that that are out there and people at every level of this um, to attack the problem and um, so there's no pre assumption really as to what is the right level of scale so as a matter of fact um, you might find um, relevance of all of them at the same time but of course you have to start somewhere now even if you go to what I would say in computational neuroscience terms is the most uh, commonly used representation on using a neuron-based abstraction of the physics happening here at this part of the, of the realm, um, there are very different types of, of representations. You can describe a neuron with a, a, a single uh, a set of equations which make it sort of, you have to solve two equations to describe the spiking behavior of a neuron. You can go to a more uh, physically based uh, representation using Hodgkin Huxley um, and a single compartment with uh, describing the membrane and everything. Or you can really mimic and model the different the physics of the different parts of the branches of the neuron. Um, and essentially you can go one step further and, and model diffusion processes. Once again, there's no right or wrong as to what is the, what is the right abstraction. But as a matter of fact, in the end, if you sort of um, consider the brain as a physical system, ultimately you will have to consider and choose this representation to the degree as to what, are you, what is really the biology and the physics you're finding. So I mean, you will start certainly at some point where you have most data to constrain it with, but ultimately there's no, no decision as to sort of this is the right uh, um, assumption or this is the right assumption. So really think of the, the way um, of, of the mathematics you're using as something which is, which is volatile in time. I mean, you will really have to adapt that according to the biology you're, you're describing. Now, for the sake of the argument, though, I circled this one, which is a description, which is a multi-compartment Hodgkin Huxley, which is commonly, I think, accepted as an interesting a description which is very linked to the, the physical um, uh, observations you can make because essentially it describes individual types of ion channels, it describes the spatial um, properties of, of uh, voltage and current um, flow in the different cells. So it allows you to, to relate what you're modeling very much to the, um, to the biology you're measuring, for example, in a neurophysiological laboratory. Now, if you do that, and actually look at what is the computational cost of these, these things and sort of say to model a single neuron you might need a megabyte of RAM and maybe a gigaflop uh, of, of computational power and if you simply multiply that out by the numbers of neurons we have in the human brain um, you actually end up with computational complexity which might be in the, in the order of an exaflop which is 10 to the power of 18 computations per second and 100 petabyte of memory. So I'm not talking storage but I'm talking something which your, your computer has to have like SDRAM memory. And this is for the Hodgkin-Huxley multi-compartment. If we actually go into the subcellular detail and add reaction diffusion, then essentially these numbers will look, look even worse. Now again, from a computer science perspective, this is fantastic news. This simply means I have a computational problem here, which again for generations to come will keep us, us busy. But the interesting thing as well is, coming from a very different 
reasons of why people build large computers, there's something which is called the top 500 of supercomputer sites. So it's something which for the last um, 30 years or so, people have been tracking what was the fastest computer in the world, in the scientifically accessible public world, not the military world, what was the fastest computer at any given point in time? And there's this red line, and you see here the certain names of computers that essentially mark this, this number. And what you see here, this is, uh, by the way, this is a logarithmic, every tick is a factor of 10, and these are the years. So what you see is that these computers had a steady um, exponential growth in all these years, and uh, sort of, it's called the top 500 because they're tracking not only the fastest computer in the world, but also the other 499 fastest computers. So essentially here you see the fastest computer, here you see the 500th fastest computer, and there's about a difference of a factor of 100 in speed for that. And interesting enough, here you see a, a typical notebook at the same time. That's about another factor of one, two, three, factor 1,000 less powerful than one of the 500th fastest computer in the world. So essentially, if you sum that up, so this computer has a certain power at any given moment in time, then sort of 500 organizations have a computer which is a thousand times more powerful than your laptop, and then there's at least one organization which has another 100 times more powerful computer at any point in time. And then sort of you see the blue line is the sum of all of these things. Now, this is all historical data. And essentially, this is, uh, if you draw, draw a line through that, you can make predictions. And it's very interesting because, as a matter of fact, computing, so you can do many things, you can sort of see how long does it take for the top number one system to become a f number f uh, 500 system, how long does it take for your laptop to be as fast as a supercomputer 10 years ago, for a lot less money, of course. Um, but essentially, what is happening is that sort of this development actually reached certain landmarks and uh, hit barriers. And this exaflop, which essentially on the previous slide showed you what is sort of the, the type of requirement for a cellular level detailed human brain scale model, um, that is coming into reach. Now, this is not happening because we want this to happen. This is happening because um, uh, countries like the United States, they don't do any overground nuclear bombs testing anymore, and they essentially decided to not do that anymore because they, thanks to simulations, can predict whether their weapons are still working. But essentially, now suddenly, the computers that calculate whether their weapons are still working become part of the national security agenda, and that drives the development of these computers. Now, we think we can do a lot better things with these computers, so we are very happy that sort of um, there's investments done that they, these computers are being built, but we think that sort of it is a very interesting opportunity for biology and neuroscience in particular to actually leverage this type of, of computing power which is coming available in the next couple of years that essentially um, wasn't there 20 years ago. I mean, we couldn't have had this talk or this level of detail of modeling um, 20 years ago simply because computer power was, was very different. So we think of this as really being an opportunity. So it's essentially something we can leverage. And um, so that's what is at the basis of the Blue Brain Project and also of the Human Brain Project, so that our um, university indeed actually acquired supercomputers for us and as well as other computational science disciplines. And that these computers on this map where I showed you computational power and memory, actually you see systems that were installed over the last uh, nine years that sort of now have really the capability for us to do up in needs you like modeling of certain types of brain um, complexities. And sort of um, this is a system which is installed in ULIC, which is the largest uh, computing center in, in, in Europe. And for reference, this is a system which is actually currently the fastest in the world, which is the Chinese machine. So essentially, the, the growth is steadily climbing. And so that's what we've been using as, as the basis. Now. Um, thanks to this development, we actually decided, and thanks to a data set Henry Markram had uh, from about 20 years of, of neurophysiology in his lab, we decided, can we actually make a proof of concept of this type of, of modeling for a certain part of this physical space? And again, there's, there's nothing preventing or saying that we'll never go down there, but it was simply the starting point of where we thought we had the most data and the most leverage to do. So as a matter of fact, this is really from channels to circuit physiology, and this is 
in the in the spirit of modeling what is there, so not modeling a function, but modeling uh, the different pieces, we actually started out to to describe and map out experimentally, and then mathematically model the different types and families of channels, of, uh, potassium channels, sodium channels, but not just one channel, but essentially with different time constants, calcium channels, chloride channels, and so on. Um, we actually, there's an interesting resource where we put this and, and future work in a, in a, in a channelpedia.net where all these, the information, the literature and these channel models are accessible. But so, similar to how you map the different channels, you actually start to look at what are the different types of cells, and this is a, maybe a somewhat uncommon representation of um, a cell, but sort of on the right-hand side you see a histogram and X and Y of sort of how the dendrite of this type of cell looks like, and in blue you see the histogram of the, of the axon. And so if you have pyramidal cells, and you have all types of interneurons, and here comes, I think I, I can, cannot mention it often enough, but sort of normally you ask the question, well, what is the, the usefulness of putting a bipolar cell or a neural glial form cell into your model? Well, the honest answer is I don't know. I put it in because it's actually there, right? Because essentially I put these pieces together in an app in to like fashion where I put them and then sort of ask what is the emergent property, for example, if I knock out that cell. So in this sense, what you're seeing here really is, is the result of the experimental mapping and, and classification and clustering of the different types of cells. And these are the shapes of cells for the different layers which we actually put into our model. The same logic goes on now for the electrophysiology, where you also see that some cells have this uh, adaptation um, of the frequency, others essentially are non-accommodating, others are stuttering, and in red you see experimental findings, and in blue you see the models that essentially we created to, to model these types of firing behavior, and not just for the somatic firing behavior, but we also put in sort of how the dendritic um, uh, uh, interplay from, for example, uh, calcium hotspots in the dendrites of pyramidal cells uh, uh, can be modeled. And that's, of course, again, possible thanks to the multi-compartment modeling, where we're actually simulating uh, every single compartment and solving about 20,000 differential equations per neuron in there. So again, so you put them, these different types of firing together, you essentially then get to the point where you ask sort of, um, where do you have to put them? So essentially you use uh, 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 um, stains for where these cells are. You use different types of, of markers to sort of find where experiment, uh, excitatory inhibitory cells are. You then sort of use different types of data from electrophysiology as well as other, other um, uh, markers to sort of distinguish where essentially, uh, the, what are the proportions of the different cell types. So you actually sort of assemble all the pieces together um, to ultimately come to the uh, circuit physiology, which then tells you which of these uh, positions should, uh, which proportion should be of which E-type, uh, so electrical firing, and then sort of what type of synapses should they have, and you put this all together. And again, it is, first of all, it's understood that this is, it's, it's a draft, right? So, I mean, you will find another type of cell, you will revisit your experimental classification, you will essentially come up with better descriptions of channel models. None of that sort of invalidates what we've been doing because the principle you have invested in the framework to put this all together and validate or sort of evaluate your model. So essentially what I'm showing you here is a, is a status of a first integration that we've been doing for this uh, uh, piece of a somatosensory cortex of a, of a young rat, it's not the barrel, but it's, uh, it's the hind limb um, cortex. And essentially you see that this type of putting it together, you see how many different types of morphoelectric classes, electrical types, you see um, the number of intrinsic synapses, you see the density of neurons, you, you essentially get all these properties of, of, your, of your circuit, which um, is essentially the best integrative approach or view of, a, of that piece of tissue you can have. But again, it's a working draft. So in a year from now, there will be glial cells. In a year from now, there will be the vascular gen. There's, there's nothing that says we will not put these things in. It's really it's a matter of essentially the right um, time and the amount of resources you will put in. Now, what is it you can do with that? Now, you can actually ask uh, um, all sorts of questions, because essentially this, this integration forces you to really look at data sets and see whether they fit together. So essentially, if you have a certain cell density that will yield a certain tissue amount of, because essentially the cells you bring, they have certain uh, dendritic tissue and axonal tissue, that in the end, through the overlap, will form um, 
boutons and synapses, then you can ask questions like, what is the inter-bouton interval? So, like, what is the emergent properties this, this tissue have? So, essentially, you can, you can look at this model uh, after you integrated it and ask the question, so what, what does this type of data integration uh, come to? And one example we've been publishing is sort of that um, certain types of interneurons, if they project onto pyramidal cells, they essentially show different innovation patterns. So essentially every blob here is where this type of pyramidal cell receives synaptic contacts from, for example, a small basket cell or from Martinotti cells. And essentially they, they are, you can distinguish them because essentially the Martinotti cells innervate the distal parts of the dendrite. And if you do that, you can essentially really data mine your, your tissue model um, more carefully as to sort of um, how does this look experimentally? So, for example, um, in, the, uh, in this uh, histogram you have here the, the um, postsynaptic view where you see sort of where a uh, histogram where on the dendrite, for example, these types of cells do receive contacts from the presynaptic type. Or here's the, post, uh, the presynaptic view where on the axon is it. And you can essentially see where this, uh, how this looks on experimental pairs of these cells and how it comes out of, out of your model. And this is, it is really an emergent property because essentially we didn't force this model to have this type of innovation pattern, but it's something through the way you integrate the data comes out as, a, as, as an emergent property. And so for this type of, this is pyramidal to pyramidal cell, you can see that essentially the way of how we, we reconstituted this, this data in the model actually allows you to have, have cell type specific innovation patterns. So this has been published uh, a few years ago. Now, why is this interesting? Because now you can do that for certain types of cells, but essentially you can now really do that for any given type of cell. You can ask the question, where from all the parts of the tissue are you actually receiving your inputs from? So you get a micro-connectome as to what, how is the cell connected with the rest of the, um, of the circuit. So essentially you can make really predictions as to sort of what type of pathways you have in, your, in, your, in this part of the brain. Um, model and essentially you can of course do that for individual cells okay you can then do it for the entirety and sort of see what type of, of pathways do you actually have in this model and again it is an emergent property because essentially we didn't force these cells to come together but we use certain principles to actually decide when they connect and then sort of you can you can observe these different uh, outcomes as a, as a prediction now another view of that is in a way that sort of you can think of the data we will do, we do uh, classical databasing, and sort of you have this big Excel sheet, which in a way is the sheet of, for the species and the age, developmental age of the animal you're looking at, and certain parameters, it doesn't really matter which, at this, for the sake of the argument, but sort of like bouton density, synapses per connection, cell types, you can actually measure these data from different type of experimental um, protocols. But then there, there are some parameters which you will not be able to measure because either it is not possible, for example, if you wanted to exactly get the distribution of an ion channel type across the dendrite of a cell, I mean, it's not uh, easily experimentally accessible. So some of these things will actually be blank. And sort of what we've been doing um, with the model we created, on the one hand, we took certain parameters we could observe, and these could be individual parameters or principles, and then essentially you realize, ah, if I know the volume and the number of cells, something like the density, for example, is, a, is something I don't have to compute. So essentially you can predict certain emergent properties of a model that, for example, synapse density, you may or may not have measured it, but essentially you can have a prediction. Now, obviously, this is a prediction, right? That doesn't mean that this is right, but it's something which possibly you can experimental test for, um, or you can override it, sort of say, no, I really think that's wrong, I should, should sort of put something else in here. So essentially you create a hypothesis. So in the end, really what, what we're doing, I mean, you can really think of, uh, of it is a huge Excel sheet of things you can measure. Some things you can't measure. We will, can use principles to predict certain um, gaps in this data, but we can expose it and make it measurable for, for validation. So this is really what we think is useful, um, and not only useful, but maybe ultimately really necessary, because one of the things this model predicts is that there are about two th more than 2,000 viable types of pathways in this uh, about the pin size of a pinhead um, um, part of the neocortex of, of a rodent. And sort of out of these 2,000 pathways, about 22 have been experimentally 
characterized. And sort of it takes about a, a year or so to really do that. You have to do all the patch clamp experiment. And it's something, will, you, will we really think that we will measure these other 2,000 181s, it's there, it, we, we don't have the incentive. There's no one who will get this PhD for this. There's no one who's getting promoted for sort of measuring these other pathways. Now, is that they're still there. It's sort of its data, which essentially is waiting to be measured, or essentially in the absence of us measuring them, well, let's make an educated guess of what these, what these things are. And then sort of override our educated guess once we essentially find that this one really is, is not there and we think it's, it's, it's worthwhile to chase it. So in, in that sense, really, we think this type of data integration exposes what data we have, what data we're missing. It, it can give you predictions about data which, is not, uh, which we haven't currently measured. And hopefully, through all the, the types of, of data which is coming online from the Brain Initiative, Allen Institute and others, I mean, hopefully we will be able to sort of fill more and more of these, these predictions with real data. But essentially, the framework is ready in this type of, of um, integration technology to sort of um, then absorb this data. So we think that sort of this gives us a novel tool. So this, this piece of, of, of visualization of the voltage activity of this piece of brain tissue, it is not the answer to sort of how the brain works. It simply shows you that sort of it is a tool which you now can expose to experimental conditions in silico. So you can essentially knock out this cell, you can stimulate that cell, you can, you can block a certain type of ion channel, you can actually test what are the emergent properties of this type of, of integration of data for this brain tissue. And we've been doing that, so essentially it's uh, quite nice. So we can actually uh, expose this, um, this tissue through um, changes in, their, in the bath. So we can, for example, increase the calcium concentration. And what you see is that such a tissue exhibits very different types of uh, synchronicity and asynchronicity regimes from a completely asynchronous to a completely synchronous type of, of reaction. And of course, they're very simple coupled networks where you can recreate the same thing. But this is an ex emergent property of this, of this um, experiment. So you can actually now look and ask the question, what a certain ion channel plays in, in the role of essentially this dynamic stage or that. You can ask the question what a cell type does to that and sort of what happens if you knock it out. Because it's an emergent property which allows you to link it from the uh, most basic ingredients you put in and then sort of make forward and causal um, chains of, of predictions of how that changes. So this is the, the type of sort of how we think um, uh, what other disciplines, again, in, in uh, engineering, um, again, I mentioned, made reference to the um, nuclear weapons, where essentially, again, they, they do the same thing. They ask the question, how does the aging effect sort of, will they still work? And so in this case, sort of, you're trying to sort of say, um, can I make a, an educated guess or a prediction through a model how a certain type of cell affects uh, the dynamic regime? One of the things we can do with that is we can, for example, make uh, um, predictions about how the local field potential of this uh, circuit looks like depending on the activity. This is work we've done in, in collaboration with Christoph Koch and Costas Anastasio. And sort of uh, that is, of course, possible. So instead of looking um, just as what is the current voltage across the membrane, you actually add up the currents, um, so as, as, as current sources. And the field, you add up the field in three dimensions from all the cells, and you can then sort of see and predict how, depending on the activity state, uh, the local field potential looks like. And it's, it's, again, it's an emergent property and really allows you to sort of, for example, assess the contributions of the synaptic currents versus the, the active dendrite currents of a neuron to the local field potential. Now, um, this really is um, possible because we built a, a system of software tools, and we combine software tools that on the one hand were already there at the community. For example, we're using uh, Neuron as the simulator for, for, all our, uh, for the current level of, 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 uh, level of detail we are using. But essentially, we did a lot of work in, in sort of optimizing the way of how we can, in a data-driven way, build uh, cells. We essentially um, build systems and software that allow us to sort of put these neuromorphologies together and build circuits, and then put this all together in, in, in a framework that allows us to, to really run through these cycles and, in a way, press a button 
and rerun this again once you have a new data type. So essentially, we've, in, the mean, in the last couple of years, we have published a real number of, of, of technologies that essentially make this all possible. Now, when I say push off a button, it is not that simple. I mean, you still need quite a lot of people that sort of help you work with that. And that really, on the other hand, is something which we would like to get better at, and which we think there's a chance for, for this to sort of um, really take the next step. And that is um, what... Uh, what to a part the Human Brain Project is about. So now the Human Brain Project is something which really is um, something which was possible because the EU has, has introduced a new instrument, a new funding instrument of how scientific projects might get funded. So instead of funding something just for four or five years, the idea was that you could possibly apply for funding for up to 10 years. Now this funding instrument was introduced in the ICT branch of the EU, which is the Information and Communication Technology. So it's not medical, it is not biological, um, it is from, an, from the technology branch of the EU. And sort of we applied with a consortium of, um, of uh, at the time we applied uh, 80 partners and sort of by, by now we are 112 partners. So as a matter of fact, in uh, early 2013, uh, the Human Brain Project was awarded one of the two flagship grants. The other one is in the area of graphene, which has nothing to do with neuroscience. It's really about bringing the, the single layer carbon uh, structures to, um, to bear. And so, but bo those two were, uh, were uh, selected and sort of uh, we were granted a ramp up phase of two and a half years, which is still under FP7. We are by now, there was an uh, open call where sort of additional partners could join. We are now 112 partner institutions across 24 countries of, of Europe. And essentially, we're right now in the phase of sort of uh, coming up with, uh, with a legal framework for the next seven and a half years, which will be happening under Horizon 2020, and sort of which again will have partner projects. Now, the, the main point I want to make is, again, I will not do justice to describing the Human Brain Project, but I want to sort of link it to this idea I was uh, describing earlier in this talk. And so at the in a way, the, one of the fabrics of the Human Brain Project really is the unifying model. So the idea, in, in difference to what we've been doing so far on the, on the rat, we will essentially focus on the mouse, and we will sort of do the same type of idea, like the Nietzsche type modeling of the human. Now, obviously, the main difference is for the mouse, we'll have a lot of data. For the human, we won't have the same amount of electrophysiology, we won't have the same, we, we, we heard a number of how, how precious the anatomy, and how precious the, the, um, some of the functional data is. So essentially, we will have to learn, of course, how to sort of get some of the principles right at the mouse, and essentially how they actually allow us to make some predictions about structure in the human, but also how they're different. So the idea clearly is to use both data sets to really come to a first draft of what the structure, what, what essentially these, these um, brains look like at a certain level of organization. And again, this is not saying we, will, we have picked the right level of description, so essentially this really is about integrating all the type of data we can get our hands on. So it's a data integration project, sort of using these two um, specimens as, as the use case. Now, there's more parts to it. Obviously, you would want to understand how these, thing, how these brains behave in a closed-loop behavior. There is, because it is a technology project, you would want to understand, because they're information processing devices, is there something I can learn about um, how these uh, cells and systems uh, um, process information? And, of course, um, we're not, not just interested in the, in the healthy brain, but we want to use medical information to understand whether some of the objective biomarkers we've been talking about, if we introduce them as variability into our models, whether essentially some of these models might have, have certain disease state as, a, as an um, emergent property. And of course, that sort of would allow you possibly to, under, to simulate some of these disease states. So the way the, the Human Brain Project will do that is essentially it will build six ICT platforms, which will make these capabilities available to the researchers within the project, as well as to researchers outside of the project. And sort of, in a way, I really today focused about what's happening in this brain simulation high performance computing, but really there's all these neuroinformatics platforms, which obviously is very relevant, where INCF is involved in building this up. We have people here from Spinnaker, 
uh, in the UK and Heidelberg uh, on the neuromorphic side. We have people uh, sort of closing the roof in the neurobotics, and then of course a, a, a big part really talking about reaching out to hospitals. Now, what the Human Brain Project will do is that sort of these six platforms, and now this is time in a way, sort of this was before the HPP, and this is the ramp up. And first of all, what we can promise is that we can build these platforms and make them actually publicly available by month 30 into the project. So one of our deliverables is to make this available at month 18, which is going to be spring next year internally, and then one year, no, uh, one year later, this is going to be released to other researchers to actually use and use the type of, of um, building um, brain models first for the mouse, as I, for example, showed, to essentially do that on this platform and sort of connect it to data sources to do uh, um, analysis and research on the medical informatics platform. And this is possible, of course, because this is not starting from zero, but it really starts from, from initiatives in Europe and the Blue Brain project I've been talking about is just one of them, but there's really many other, for example, facets, brain scan spinnaker, which are in the neuromorphic realm. There's a lot of prior work at Schuf, which has gone into the medical informatics work. INCF obviously has, has really pioneered the, the neuroinformatics part. So essentially what this flagship, very much in the spirit of how the EU come up with it, is meant to sort of really um, coordinate and synergize these, these uh, initiatives to a common goal. And so then what will happen after the ramp-up phase, in the phase which is uh, under Horizon 2020, there will be different steps of, of improvements to these, to these platforms after they've been made public. And there are certain commitments as to sort of that we will have first draft models of uh, the, the, the two specimens I've been talking about on the one hand on the mouse, as well as eventually on the human, which essentially will obviously be not the final models of how the brain works, but it will be something, the amount of the data we will have at that time integrated um, at, the, at the formalisms we can, we can um, um, parameterize at that time, which we think on the one hand is going to be cellular and then more and more multi-scale in the end. And, but I think what's exciting about all that is that sort of this platform and there's funding um, foreseen that sort of these platforms can be used by partnering projects so that essentially outside scientists can actually receive funding to actually do research and really leverage the type of, of technology we've been developing in these unifying models and the other platforms we have. So essentially there will be different calls and different possibilities for scientists to, to, to join along this, this journey. Now, what I've described is sort of just a glimpse of, of um, how the Human Brain Project works and sort of the, some of the, the fabric that, that keeps it together. But I want to end on really something which I think is going to be the one, really one challenge. And that is, that is a unique multidisciplinary effort we're trying to do. Now CERN has shown that sort of scientists can work together in the order of groups of thousands and really pull off amazing things. I think that neuroscience hasn't yet sort of come anywhere close to that number. And not only, of course, is it that we don't have the experience, but it's also the different types of discipline, the different colors here, really. I mean, while at CERN, you might have mostly physicists, maybe some engineers. Um, here we're really talking about that we have um, experimental physicists from, from Mars, the human. We have theoreticians. We have engineers and computer scientists. We have... Uh, um, people working in neurobotics, and essentially the, the amount of, of training in different languages amongst them, I think, is, is really the challenge for us to come. But I think that the brain needs this type of interdisciplinarity to work together and really make a major push forward. So I think we're excited to try it, but I really think that sort of it will ask every single one of us to sort of come up with a willingness to sort of go this extra step and collaborate with your different, uh, different peers in this project. If you want to learn more, there are websites of the Blue Brain Project and the Human Brain Project. There are several people in this audience that work on the Human um, Brain Project, and we have also Jeff Miller. Where's Jeff? Back there. He's here. He's working hard on sort of making these platforms uh, consumable um, by, by researchers from the outside. So if you want to have a, a sneak preview, or have some discussions how that might work, he's around for the next days to, to talk to us and then we are here to, um, to answer any more questions. Thank you very much.
So what does the, the validation framework look like for your, when you're actually testing the model? Is it like a, a suite of, of data-driven unit tests that you run every Saturday night and then you get the scores back and you, you have a meeting and talk about them? And, and do you have like, you know, uh, do you then take versions of that and, and, and split that up into different models that you run and just try to move up the, the leaderboard in terms of the performance in that suite? Or is it more like manual than that? What is it, what is it like? So it, um, it's very much like a, um, a unit test where sort of you have reference values uh, uh, put and stored somewhere and so you, you, you track all the provenance of sort of how this model with this parameter, first of all, where did the parameters come from to build the model and then sort of how does this model perform uh, against the, the validation data which also has to have a, a reference of origin where it's coming from. And sort of um, we do that across different levels. So we actually do that for the ion channels. We do that for the individual cells. We do that then for pairs of... So we actually, repair, like for example, run thousands of dual patch clamp experiments in virtual to sort of see whether, for example, the statistics and the properties of those work. And then sort of you go to the network level and so on. So yeah, that's, that's very systematic. And that's really the, the investment which you can reuse if actually you change the model or you have the next version of the draft model that you can then sort of see how does this newer version of the model uh, compare in all these metrics to an older version of the model you built. So it's, it's hierarchical too then? You, you, you have the best version of the cell model and then the, they, that goes into being tested at the circuit well, level and so on? Well, so the interesting thing is, so there's, um, it's, it's not a pure ranking on what's the best model because as a matter of fact, you don't necessarily, so you, you have a certain, I mean, certain data you use to build the model and sort of then you validate at the level, but it could be that suddenly at the network level, you have no longer the emergent property. So that wouldn't cause us to sort of now suddenly do a search and sort of try to tune the model, but it would simply be a, a, an outcome that says, okay, your model has no longer this emergent property, which actually triggers a scientific question as to why that is. I mean, why did you lose it? And it's actually a very interesting question because essentially it, it tells you that, wait a second, how, how did I miss something? Did I sort of introduce a certain uh, mistake? So it's really, it's part of the method to actually sort of not automatically choose the best, but sort of see how the model behaves and then sort of trigger the next scientific curation action of that process. In your uh, presentation, you took a uh, very strong physicist point of view on the matter. However, the brain is not only a physical system, but also a living system. Mm -hmm. Each cell in the brain is, has at least the complexity of an enormous uh, co uh, production unit, including intrinsic uh, organization, uh, logistics, and uh, homeostasis, and a continuous uh, gene expression profile. So if you want to do up initial modeling, you should start with the modeling of a single cell in its all living attitudes and properties. So my question is, is that your planning or not? And if not, then uh, what are the impacts of, uh, say, this kind of limitations on the internal structure on the properties of that cell? Right. So, no, I, I think it's a, it's a good and fair question. I mean, first of all, absolutely, I would still consider that even a living thing is a physical thing, uh, a physical system, in the sense that sort of in principle... By its organization, it has living properties. Yeah, but I would... Again, I would at least take the standpoint um, as a physicist that sort of I can describe the the, the rules and the dynamics that sort of uh, that determine the development of the system or the the actual uh, reaction to it at the moment and the living of. I think it's still physical properties that work. So. You cannot capture the gene expression profiles. That's the result of an evolutionary. I think I think that's a secondary question. That I mean, there are many properties which I presumably will never be able to capture. And I mean, sort of, they might be gene expression profiles, they might be, on the other hand, certain types of, of, of microstructure for the human brain, which I will never be able to, to really find because we will not have the imaging mechanisms to do that. So I, I acknowledge that there are certain parts of the physical mechanisms of the system which I will not be able to sort of uh, describe ab initio. So essentially, whenever I described it, I sort of mentioned ab initio-like. So the, the hope would be is that I can, at some level, describe the physical processes governing certain type of plasticity, homeostasis, that essentially can model these physical processes to some degree. Now, essentially, I'll have to be pragmatic about it and sort of choose a level where essentially I can find some data 
about uh, how to uh, how to con con conf um, sort of specify them and and and, uh, and sort of choose the parameters. And essentially, hopefully, over time, I'll I'll learn more and might be able to put more physics into that. Right. So and that's. But I mean, to me, the the questions of how to, for example, model a homeostasis or plasticity governs the same idea of how I model cells. I mean, I have to find which data from the experiment do I have, and sort of what is it, uh, what type of, of parameters I can extract from that. So, I mean, to me, this is the, the, the dynamics of a system is not really different from sort of the structural part of, it, of the system. But I acknowledge that sort of, for example, many developmental processes today, I think they're completely under constrained in sort of us understanding all the physical processes at work, which is why we actually chose to have a snapshot model of a, of a certain point in time. And we will have to test with all the validation suites we, we have before whether the emergent properties are good enough. If they're not good enough, we, we really see that we're missing something and we'll have to dig deeper. So none of that is really magic in the sense that sort of I'll, I'll somehow come up with a, uh, with a fast bypass to that physics. If, if essentially a homeostatic principle is the crucial principle to the functioning of the brain, well, we'll have to find it because essentially I mean, that, that's then this, this way of, of approaching the, the problem really simply exposes to you that if you don't model that part of the physics, the system will not behave properly. So we will not, that will not be a failure for us because it will simply show us where do we have to put more effort into finding and measuring certain physical properties. Thanks for your response. So be beautiful uh, presentation, Felix. Uh, please look at the gallery. Okay, <laughs> we are up here. <laughs> um, since the HBP project is an IT project, I have a sort of a computer science question here. Uh, you made very clear that there was a beautiful development in, in uh, technology, essentially Moore's law, and everything shows exponentially upward. Uh, but um, conceptually, uh, nothing has changed. The underlying computational model is the Turing machine. And so my question is, what is the underlying model for the HBP? Do you believe that what we are trying to do is build a different Turing machine? Or is there actually a different model? And then what is that? In particular, what is the memory model? Uh, so, uh, I, I would be very curious. That actually, I think it's actually one of the reasons why I'm personally interested in this project. I think that for computer science, I think there's a lot, an exciting road ahead. Now, I, I would, uh, we, we thought a little bit more than, um, which I can give as an answer to that. Now, obviously, I think the Turing machine and the classical digital computers that implement a sort of a Turing machine and sort of which the trend I showed you, I think they're very good at what they're doing. I think they're extremely good at solving differential equations, which essentially human brains are not very good at. So as a matter of fact, I, th I am very glad about that sort of we will continue to build classical Turing machines because it allows me to sort of solve systems of differential equations of, of ever-growing size. But I do believe that there are other ways of, of doing computation, which in a way the brain shows us that you can, can do that. And then there's quantum Turing machines. So there are other types of, of, of uh, computational uh, paradigms which we can see that they're happening. So I, I would answer to that that, yes, I think there will be especially um, uh, uh, computing paradigms where sort of memory and the operations are not as separated in digital computers. But I think digital computers are extremely helpful to, for us to describe the physical system that actually has this other computing paradigm. So I think to me, one is the means to find sort of the computing paradigms of another physical system. And which, by the way, then you can go one step further and you can build artificial systems that sort of use the way that the brain works to sort of possibly do computations similar to the brain, which doesn't mean that they will be very good at solving differential equations. So I think the future, if I, if I look at, I don't know, 20, 10, 15 years from now, I think we'll have hybrid information processing systems, ones which are very good at solving differential equations and others which are more uh, interesting to sort of come up with approximate type of solutions to very real world complex problems and sort of depending on what is it you're trying to solve, your mobile phone will have different types of processors, one which is sort of trying to do the calculate the compression with classical digital computing and on the other hand trying to interpret your, your spoken word by a more neuro inspired processing uh, model. I don't know if this is this on. Okay, <laughs> here. <Please. laughs> um, I have sort of a comment, but way at the other end. Um, the 
the brain is a physical system, but it's also at, at the level of neurons and subcellular processes, a chemical system for sure. Um, the, and, and I think that's important not to leave out. That it, physical chemistry is the way that one would model what goes on with the chemistry, but it is chemistry. Um, yeah. And the memory processes involve chemistry and physical chemistry. So I think it will just be important for you to re realize that going forward. I get, I squirm <laughs> when I hear um, physicists sort of want to take over the understanding of the brain <laughs> because there's this tension always between chemistry and physics. So I just wanted Point to taken. say that chemistry and physical chemistry are incredibly important at the level of understanding, for example, memory processes right. in the brain. Point taken. I actually squirm when sort of physicists take over and sort of want to explain the, br the brain. I, I'm with you there. Um, and I would say that in my hand waving, I since chemistry at the base is governed by the laws of physics, I would ex include it, but I do fully, uh, <laughs> I, I would fully, fully grant to you that sort of obviously the, the, the language chemistry has developed is extremely useful to sort of describe what's going on and I think that's the right way of putting it and so if I should revise my language there and sort of talk about biochemical and bio... Yeah. Hello, yeah, so... Um yeah, it's very impressive in terms of, uh, of the computational power, uh, how you, you basically can, you know, can project when you will be able to have the computational power to run these models. But there's another limitation, and this is really, I mean, this immense search space in the, para the parameter space to search. For example, if you really want to go to function, um, the question is, is there any hope to have enough observations that you actually can constrain the strength of the synapses, for example? Uh, in particular, if there is, uh, you know, higher order statistical structure in them. And so my question is, I mean, I can see and it's nice how you can show that if you put in certain connectivity primitives of the cells that you can actually predict other properties of the connectivity of the, of the density of synapses and you can test that. But my question is, um, I, I see really a, another principal stumbling block here in terms of getting to function, which has to do with the limited number of observations that we can have about, for example, strength of, synap of synapses. Right, so I, mean, I, I think you didn't imply it, but just to make sure, so we, we don't search, right? I mean, it's not sort of that we are doing an optimization based on a, on a fitness criteria. So, I mean, the hope, that, that, but I think you, 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 you... Right, but that's sort of, that loop is sort of on a, on a sort of scientific decision level, so it's not on a... On a uh, sorry, no, I, I grant it. So, I think the, the there again... Um, there's the possibility that this actually will never sort of um, exhibit certain types of functions because maybe in order to do that you would have to simulate the entire development of a neural system with all its uh, uh, epigenetic stimulus as well as the, the uh, environmental stimulus. It's a possibility that that comes out and then sort of um, uh, we would, would acknowledge that. I think on the other hand, sort of there is quite a lot of finding that of course, I mean, if you look at... Um, um, certain types of how synaptic strength is actually related and, and predicted by other things. So maybe, for example, you can, you can infer it from some of the EM data which is coming online from a connectome project, for example, to sort of have a pre-configuration of a certain type of, of brain connectivity. Or on the other hand, we know from our own work of sort of how common neighbor connectivity actually has a very large influence on sort of the actual weight. Um, and then sort of, of course, we can put these systems through learning as well, right? We can simulate the physics of the, of the plasticity and sort of explore how far we get with it. But I, I do grant to you that sort of, I mean, there could be limitations. I think it's part of the scientific process to actually see how, how much of a history of a biological system you'll actually have to, to, uh, to, to model. Hello. I have a small question here. <laughs> So you mentioned that the first idea is to simulate the entire rat brain, then move to human brain. Don't you think it's a very big jump immediately? <laughs> because yes, it's simple, like if I move from Windows to Macintosh, <laughs> there are a lot of challenges which I face, but like rat and human brain immediately, how, how do you think? Or, <laughs> 
So first of all, uh, it's mouse, but it's Manara possible. Uh, it's possible just that, like in the pipeline, it's too let, let big. Me, let me put this yeah. way. I mean, I, so I think it is another um, possibility that sort of obviously you you can uh, you would have to sort of um, model additional biological systems on an evolutionary path to sort of really come closer. And I think um, which ones of those there every anybody's pick, right? I mean, sort of some it's the marmoset, others say it's the macaque. I mean, you 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 choose whatever you want. The main point I want to say is that the the interesting thing about the mouse, well. First of all, it's it's a mammalian brain. Second, of course, a lot of the the genetic tools we have available will give us really an amount of insight into into principles of how structure, cell, cell function, synaptic uh, um, ion channels, and all of that uh, interactions, uh, kinetic rates, and stuff. How those things actually come about, which I think will not be easily accessible in a higher level mammal. I mean, I don't think we will do the same type of experiments with a marmoset, for example. So essentially, I think the the, the mouse really, first and foremost, is is a model which is really accessible and sort of will allow us to learn a lot of principles. And I think then through transcript, uh, single cell transcriptomics, uh, the idea would be that sort of you can go from there to sort of how. Uh, a slightly different genome, and sort of how would that express and unfold into certain functions? And uh, if the jump is uh, to the human is too high, we will we will find out. But the human is the goal. I mean, I think sort of what we really care for is that essentially research around the world is happening on the human, and we essentially want to position this tool as an additional tool to help us understand the the research we're doing about the human brain. And sort of um, in principle, there's no conceptual problem that we couldn't apply these types of data-driven model generation for other species, we would have to organize the data sets in the exact same rigor, but essentially we would be able to, to produce uh, models of those brains as well. So I think there is, I mean, it is, it is part of the scientific agenda. I don't essentially, again, I cannot give you any certainty, but there's reasons for why we really want to get the mouse going. And I think uh, there's reasons of why we really want the human data because that's what we care for. That's what essentially uh, we need to deliver on, on as, a, as a community on results. And I think the methodology we are implying and developing really are not specific to these two, but essentially could be applied to other specimens as well. Thank you. Felix. Rodney. Very clear talk. The, the part which I find less clear is your use of this word emergent, which you use very frequently. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you first of all explain what it is that you mean by that, uh, what makes it special? And then you could explain perhaps with that um, Blue Brain Project now in its seven years of existence brings me towards designing a neuromorphic system that has a specific task. You know? So I'm trying to understand something about what we've learned about brain function at the level where I can use this for design for the solution of problems. So I'm absolutely not um, disputing the beautiful collection of data. I want to know what I'm learning in terms of understanding. Okay, so first, for your first uh, question on, on emergence. I mean, to me, emergence is um, uh, that you actually model the constituents and the constituents of a system as well as the interactions, and you have non-trivial um, solutions from the, the time solution of the description of the constituents and their interactions. I think that's sort of the, the physically accepted uh, um, definition of emergent, and that's really very much how I, I'm using it and, and understand it. Now, sort of, um, what have I learned from the Blue Brain Project to build a neuromorphic system? An emergent phenomenon that relates to processing. I'm afraid you have to have been informed that I must, must, must call it to an end because the city of Leiden will not wait for us at this reception that we're having. So if you can take that offline, I would greatly appreciate it. So, thank you.